Hi guys, it's me Chazar HD and welcome to this incident analysis for the 2019 Japanese Grand Prix at Suzuka and we're going to analyse plenty of stuff from the Grand Prix, very exciting race and yet there is plenty to look at. Now first off, we're going to look at the contact at turn 2 on the first lap between Charles Leclerc and Max Verstappen. Now Charles Leclerc, I believe after the race, got a 5 second penalty for this contact and You'd have to agree with the decision by the stewards, and I'm going to show why I agree with them. So, as you can see here, Max Verstappen trying to go around the outside of Charles Leclerc. And then, as we come through, say, the middle of turn two, Verstappen does have the line going into then turn three. But Charles Leclerc, of course, and he has every right to do so, is fighting back to keep his position because he knows that Max Verstappen in this Grand Prix is going to be very quick. And he does not want Max Verstappen holding him up or you know, preventing him from getting the race victory. And then, of course, Leclerc makes contact with Max Verstappen. And then Verstappen goes off the track. And eventually, later on, he retired from the race with what I believe was a rear suspension problem after the contact or a uh, lot of damage to the rear floor after, again, the contact with Charles Leclerc. Now. It was obviously Charles Leclerc's fault. There is no doubt about that. And I'm going to show why now. So, firstly, from Max Verstappen's on board. As you can see here, Verstappen isn't offline. But he's deliberately taking a wider line through Turn 1 and Turn 2. So to give Charles Leclerc space. But also to have the better exit going into uh, you know, the exit of Turn 2 and the entry to Turn 3. And as you can see here, again, he is way further away from the apex where you normally would be if you were going through this corner on your own. Because he's trying to give Charles Leclerc enough space for both of them to make it through the corner. But obviously he doesn't want to give him too much space. So Leclerc keeps a position ahead of Max Verstappen. And then after that, Leclerc spins Max Verstappen on the exit of turn two. Now. Now I'll show you this angle from Lewis Hamilton's on board because this really does show why Charles Leclerc is at fault. So again, you can see the two cars ahead, Verstappen on the outside, Leclerc on the inside. Verstappen again, deliberately taking a wider line to you know, allow Charles space but also to have a good exit off of turn two. But Leclerc is also way away from the apex of the corner and is understeering clean into Max Verstappen. And that is exactly what Charles Leclerc does. In his desperate attempt to keep Max Verstappen behind, he just clean, understeers into him, and takes him off the track. Now, Charles Leclerc, I have to make this point very clear, that Charles Leclerc was entitled to fight for his position, because they were about side by side. But one thing obviously you cannot do is just understeer off the apex of the corner and wipe someone off the track and eventually out of the race. And that's exactly what he did. And he fully deserved the penalty he got in the Japanese Grand Prix. And also, I will say that Ferrari or the FIA or someone should have put Ferrari in a position where they had to pit Charles Leclerc at the end of the first lap with the damage he had to his front wing because... Once those pieces fell off, it was very dangerous for drivers like Lewis Hamilton and Carlos Sainz and Alex Albon. So, very dangerous there. And that was not a good thing to see, especially as we've, you know, in Formula 1 history, had incidents where drivers have been hurt by debris falling off a car ahead. So, not very smart. And I think Ferrari or someone should have forced Leclerc to come into the pits to get a new front wing because it was clear that his front wing was not in a safe condition after the contact with Max Verstappen. But now let's get into another incident, the Albon Norris crash at the final chicane. Now for me, I don't think Albon is actually at fault for this. I've seen a couple of people saying Albon was a bit too aggressive, but in my opinion, Lando Norris really should have seen Albon coming and here's why. So you can see here Albon as they start braking, is closing in a lot in the braking zone. And as we get to this point, Alex Albon has enough of his car alongside to deserve space going into the chicane, but also 
Another point is that because Red Bull have a much faster car than McLaren and Albon was clearly faster than Norris at the time, why Lando did not see him coming, I don't quite know. And I don't really understand why he felt the need to turn in, especially if he did know he was there. If he didn't know he was there, then you could be a bit more lenient towards Lando. But if he knew Albon was throwing it down the inside, then why did he decide to turn in? Because Albon at that point of the race was a lot quicker and the Red Bull car is a lot faster. And we've seen this with Lando in the past that he is actually very smart in letting faster cars pass when they actually have a look down the inside at a particular corner. So why he decided to not let Albon go, who was clearly faster, I, I really don't understand. And this incident actually cost uh, Lando Norris time, because of course he went off the track right after. But you can see, once we get to the apex of the corner, they're side by side, but Norris is now turning fully in. You can see the Family Mart piece on the McLaren um, end fence that is right next to Albon's left front tyre. That is Lando turning into Alex Albon, who has already put his car enough, enough up the inside to deserve space and to complete the overtake. But again, for some reason, Lando decides to just turn in. And of course, they made contact and Lando went off the track. And yeah... Lando should have been a lot smarter in letting Albon go through because, again, Albon was in a much, much faster car. But now, let's get to the big controversy of the jump start of Sebastian Vettel. Now, what I'm about to show you is how he jumped the start and the evidence for it. And it's pretty clear that Sebastian Vettel jumped the start of the race in Japan. So you can see here, he's on pole position. He hasn't moved yet. As the five lights are on. But then as I move on to the next picture. You can see there he has clearly moved. If I go back. And then forward. And do it a few more times. You can clearly see that Sebastian Vettel. With the five lights on. Has moved before the lights have gone out. Which is a jump start. Now it's pretty clear that it's a jump start. And it should have been a clear penalty for Sebastian Vettel. I don't care about the semantic or technical argument against this. Pretty simply, in a black and white way, if you move before the start signal is given, you have jumped the start. I don't care if you haven't gained anything by it. If you move before the lights go out, you have jumped the start. Simple. It doesn't matter whether you've gained or lost anything. You have to punish that because it's a pretty simple rule. That if you move before those five lights go out, you have jumped the start. Now, there is actually precedent for this, um, this type of jump start in the past. And there's a link below to a Grand Prix. I want you guys to go and watch the start of that Grand Prix only. And watch the start of the 2006 Canadian Grand Prix. Because at that Grand Prix, Giancarlo Fisichella, who was lined up in second place... If you watch the start and also the start replay, what Fissy Keller does is he does the same thing as Sebastian Vettel. He goes, then he stops, and then when the lights go out, he does lose a position to Kimi Raikkonen. So he didn't gain anything by doing it, but in that Grand Prix, he was given a penalty for a jump start. And you can't say, well, the way the FIA give give out jump starts now compared to 2006 is different. It's really not because they use the transponders and have been using the transponders for the cars on the grid for a very long time and they were back then for Fissy Keller. So if they were going to give Fissy Keller a penalty for that incident back then, why not for Vettel even though again Vettel didn't gain anything? It doesn't matter. Fissy Keller didn't gain anything with what he did in Canada and he still got a penalty. So I don't understand how it's any different from what Sebastian Vettel did. But anyway, you can see that Vettel, you know, then moved. And then he stopped as the lights went out. And that's why he got such a terrible start. Because he stopped um, right when the lights actually went out. And then as he got going, um, of course, right after that, he got passed very comfortably by Valtteri Bottas. But yeah, a clear jump start. There is no debate about it. No debate. He jumped the start and he should have got a penalty. Of course, it wouldn't have had a big effect on his result. 
he wouldn't have finished in P2, but he would have been on the podium because he was quick enough to get the podium. But still, it was a jump start. It's a clear penalty. There is no debate to be had about that, in my opinion. And the final thing we are going to analyse is the crash at turn one and turn two on the final lap. Now, because the checkered flag was waved early, a lap early, I believe, this incident, I guess, doesn't really matter that much because Sergio Perez finished in P9 and Pierre Gasly finished in P8. But I still think we should analyse it. But as you can see here, Sergio Perez trying to go round the outside at turn two, very similar to Max Verstappen. But for me, Gasly is just as at fault as Leclerc was. And if the race actually ended after the 53 laps, I think Pierre Gasly probably should have got a penalty because... What Gasly did was probably worse than what Leclerc did on the first lap because, as we'll see, Perez has more of his car ahead going into turn two and Gasly just spins Perez out, as we'll see in a moment because I'm going to go to this angle, which really does showcase it better. So, again, Perez, you can clearly see that on the left. He has comfortably his car ahead of Pierre Gasly. And then you can see here, Perez is now starting to sail around the outside. And as we cut to this picture, again, Sergio Perez really does have the line into the exit of turn two and the entry to turn three. But Gasly simply just takes him off. And Perez, of course, ended up in the wall. But thankfully for Perez, again, the checkered flag was waved early. And he still got P9. A great drive, by the way, by Sergio Perez. And even Pierre Gasly, even though... This incident for him was not that great. But guys, let me know in the comment section, what do you think of my opinion of these incidents at the Japanese Grand Prix? And let me know what you think of these incidents at the Japanese Grand Prix in the comment section down below. And also, don't forget to subscribe for more content like this and like this video for more content like this. And until our next video, which is the podcast, this time tomorrow at 12pm UK time on Tuesday, it has been me. Kazer HD, goodbye.